So you don't necessarily have to come in here, but if you don't really give a crap about what we have to say, just keep it down so that those that do care can listen. Great. Thank you. All right, we got a great customer perspective panel. And in the case of Merv, independent analyst panel. Matt, how you doing? Thank you. Okay, uh, on the far left is Linda Apsley. I love, their, I love this title, Vice President of Revenue and Data Engineering at Time. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit, Linda. Uh, Linda's got a you know, really interesting background from the Seattle area, has touched a couple of the bases up there with some of the big companies like Amazon and Microsoft, so thank you very much for making the time to come on the panel. Ben Garrett is the Director of Platform Architecture and Operations uh, at Auto Trader or, uh, okay, so Auto Trader is sort of the umbrella, so we'll talk about that. Uh, and then of course Merv Adrian, Vice President at Gartner, very well known, analyst, pundit, thinker. Uh, George Gilbert is gonna join me in sort of co-moderating this panel. So then let me start with you. I, I asked you about the title. Where does that come from? And we've been geeking out here. Uh, you're really, you know, the, one of the questions that we haven't addressed is the business value piece. That's kind of your job. Revenue in the title. Talk about the title, your role, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so uh, about a year ago, Time started this initiative recognizing that data is our future. And uh, interestingly enough, what I heard initially when I was given this role was you need to figure out how to make Time a data-driven company. And what I learned really fast was that Time is already a data-driven company circa 1996. <laughs> and so we needed to modernize. And along with this data piece, my team uh, owns the consumer marketing tools, right? What is it the consumer marketing uses to drive additional revenue? And also the advertising tools. So when I met with my new leaders, when I came into this role, and I, I put it out to the team, what should we call them, uh, call the team? And I had two of my leaders say, well, we, we drive revenue for the company because without the advertising platform and without the subscription platform, we wouldn't be bringing the money in. So we should claim it. Let's, let's just say that that's what we do. And I thought, okay. So we, we took the revenue piece that speaks to the consumer marketing and the advertising platforms and then the data, which really speaks to our future in predictive intelligence. So the data vector and the revenue vector have come together and essentially that's how you and your team are measured. That's right. That's cool. Yeah. All right, Ben, I wonder if you could talk about I an mean, operations perspective, and, and I'm going to have a little uh, Q&A with you two, a little you know, scenario, hypothetical scenario, but talk about your role, uh, and I'm specifically, I saw a presentation that you gave at Informatica World, and I'm specifically interested in what's changed, because you had sort of, this is the way it used to be, this is the way it is now. So I wonder if you talk about your role, and your role as a change agent. Okay, yeah, so... Uh I've been with Cox Automotive, which is the parent company for Auto Trader, Kelly Blue Book, uh, Mannheim Auto Auctions, and a lot of different companies in the automotive space for about two years now. And I was brought on to bring in big data technologies to the organization. So it's been a big change and a big transformation for the org on the whole, right? So we were very much a, an MPP database, an Atiza shop across the board. And that's how we sort of did all of our data processing and, and data provisioning. And, you know, it's, it's been sort of a challenge for us and, and almost a necessity to move to this new big data technology because, you know, Cox Automotive was formed from about 27 different business units in the automotive space. It touches entirely the, the, the whole life cycle of the vehicle all the way through. And each of these companies generates and shares a lot of data. And in fact, in a lot of cases, we have data that travels back and forth between orgs and gets value added throughout the chain and sort of this whirlwind of, of, of data flow. And it becomes a very difficult thing for us to manage. So what we've done is built this central enterprise data hub, partnering with Cloudera, to provide one place for us to store all the data that we, that we generate both internally and externally, right, so that we can all share it and then provide entitlements on top of that so that all the different business units and, and analyst communities can get access to and leverage that data. So that's been a, a really fun challenge because it, it changes the mindset of a lot of folks. I mean, you, you go from a very traditional SQL world to this new world where, you know, you're, you're doing development as opposed to just writing SQL and, and the tools are, are sort of evolving as we go along. So it's been a, a, a very cool challenge to, to sort of sit down and do this and um, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. All right, Merv, so um, been a lot of discussion about the survey that you guys just did. 
a little bit of controversy around it. It's kind of survey week. We did our little survey, little humble survey. Gartner came up with a survey. Databricks came up with a survey, said Spark's going to eat the world. Uh, there was another survey I saw that was, you know, a couple thousand that was kind of interesting. I love survey data, right? Me too. Everybody, what everybody does is they, they glom onto whatever, you know, supports their scenario and say, oh, here's the data. But what I like to do, and I'm sure you do too, is to try to find the commonalities. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that data says, what the Gartner survey says, and then we we'll want to try to relate it to what's actually happening within the practitioner community. There was an interesting metaphor used a little while ago for what we do by someone from Red Hat, but, but I won't go there. Um, we, we collectively, you, us, um, Spark, uh, um, other people, we survey population segments. Um, and how those population segments are chosen and how they describe themselves is as important as the data we get from them. So in Gartner's case, there are two very different specific surveys, one that's about big data and one that's about Hadoop specifically. The good news is we get relatively similar data back from those two separate surveys about adoption rates, which you asked about before. Um, but Sean pointed out before that the numbers that Gartner has published that said 44% of people that we surveyed, these are, I'll describe them, enterprise senior executives, uh, C-level executives, not uh, practitioner level people who tend to skew much higher, by the way, on these tools. Um, Sean and I kind of agree that we're at a moment where the rise is just about coming, that we're getting into the early mainstream. And I think nothing exemplifies that more than what these two folks just said. Both of them talked about outcomes, not about bits and bytes, not about the technologies or the version numbers, or whether there's a new open source product that was announced yesterday that's going to replace the two that aren't ready yet that we're already using. Yeah, they talked about what are we going to do with this and how are we going to measure the value of it. When an emerging technology market begins to define itself and market itself to its prospects and customers in terms of the value it's going to deliver, now we're talking. This is when things start to happen. And that's how you have to reach a mainstream market. Um, the audience at Strata is, it's, it's not brimming with geekitude the way it did a couple of years ago, right? It's about business people who are asking about value. Okay, so, so let's talk about some of those, those outcomes. So you, both change agents in different roles within the organization. So everybody talks about trying to become a data-driven company. So what does that mean to you? Are you really a data-driven company? How do you know when you become a data-driven company? What do you do to create a data-driven company? What's really different? Linda, can you help us? I know there's like 18 questions in there, but it's, it's a big topic, and most companies that we talk to you know, aren't there, right. you know, not even close. And you yeah. may say that about yourself, I don't know, but at least your, your job is yeah. to get there. So I wonder if you could talk about that journey a little bit. Yes, I'm happy to. I, I view it from two perspectives. I view it from analytics, which is how are we doing based upon the past? And that's all about collecting data, it's measuring you know, for us how many subscriptions do we have, how well are our advertisements performing, um, how many people are viewing the ads, right? It's a, it's a backwards view. Very, very important, I think, for any company to understand what's happening currently and using data to determine uh, where we're successful or not. That's where our company has done extremely well. The piece we need to add in now is this predictive capability. So as we tag this website, what does it tell us about our customers? So much of what's happening in the market today is about the individual, and I think especially in media, right? We need to be able to target your interests. What is it you want to see? If you're a Royals watcher and you want to know when the baby's born, how do we get that information to you in a way that's, that's fun, that, that engages you in, in our content? And that piece really requires these predictive engines. And so for my team, we've been, now to take it back to the TAC, you know, we've been modernizing and moving to the cloud a lot of our uh, backwards looking capabilities, which are the, the system analytics. And at the same time, we're building on the Pivotal platform our predictive capability where we're bringing together data from all over the company where it used to sit in silos with individual businesses using it to drive specific outcomes to look both to the past and to the future. And I think that's really the, the key point of where a lot of businesses are in the enterprise, is many do understand the past to varying degrees, but if we don't get on this wave of understanding the future and how to engage our audiences as individuals and their interests, I think we'll get lost. So, it reminds me, I heard Ray Paquette, is that his name? Analyst at Gartner? Yes. Give a talk about hybrid IT. And it was sort of 
these two worlds, and I think the premise was they've got to come together. And I know I used to work at a big research company, so everybody's got different scenarios. But I, I wanted to sort of mention that as a, as a mental model for what we live in today, this world where you've got the DevOps guys rushing hard and you've got the 19-year-old legacy apps. But you deal with that every day. What's that platform look like? Is it a hybrid IT world? Uh, are you trying to bring those two worlds together? How do you do that? We're working on that today. We're, we're having those conversations now, actually. How do, we, how do we sort of move faster on the ops side? Because we're growing from you know, in leaps and bounds. You know, you mentioned, you know, you asked the question about how data affects us, and I'd say data is our business, right? Like, at the core of it, what we do, and I, I'll use AutoTrader and Kelly Blue Book as prime examples for this, I mean, data is exactly what we do. I mean, it takes the form of listings, it takes the form of vehicle valuations, right? But at its core, it's taking a lot of data and synthesizing it and providing it back out to the individual consumers, right? So for me, I think that's, I mean, that's where we need to go. And, and to get there requires a different kind of thinking around operations, right? So cloud becomes a major part of our infrastructure and is and the way we're having to move in order to grow quickly. And I think, um, I mean, that's, that's just the way we have to operate. And DevOps becomes a thing that is like ingrained in our culture as a result of that. It's the only way you can move fast. It's the only way you can develop things at rapid pace, so. So Merv, we live in this hybrid world, hybrid cloud, hybrid IT. Somebody emailed me before and said, ask Merv about hybrid transaction analytical processing. All right, okay. Yes. <laughs> How much so, time have you got? So, no. anyway. so no. but that's any a very thoughts important. on this? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a very please, please important point. Um, HTAP, our acronym, it, it's, is about the notion that long running activities in a business, you can call them transactions if you want, but the old notion of what a transaction is has changed a bit. But before we get done with it, there are analytics in stream. We don't separate the two, although many of us conceptually do in our organizational structures and the tools we choose. But they come together when we really start to think about not the past, because it's good to understand it. We can't change it. We can change the future. So predictive turns into proactive. And if I can do the analytics within the context of whatever it is I'm trying to do that presumably delivers value, I do it differently. I change literally midstream. I change the discount rate I'm offering. I offer a different subscription. I, 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 I direct this person to a different car uh, than the one they were thinking about just based on what I've learned while the transaction's going on. That's affecting transformation. That's what we're talking about here. That's what this technology the, all the technology we're talking about here uniquely differs from the former technologies in because the, the synergies that come when you put those different kinds of data together while activity is in motion gives you the power to change the outcome. Changing that outcome, maybe serving up Kansas City Royals information as opposed to Camelot or something like that. I think she on. meant the British Royals, didn't you? <laughs> no, yeah. I said as opposed to Camelot. Oh, all right, I got it, I got it, okay. Yes, you can it here so you can do it. Okay. Um, Linda and Ben, I, you know, one of the things that's, that's become clear um, is that as businesses digitize, they're essentially going through a different channel, and then it's almost like they have to reverse engineer their entire business. The business changes. Um, at, that, at that level, can you tell us, for instance, take for example the New York Times. It's like their newsroom has to change, you know, because they're not on a daily cycle or whatever. So the, the whole notion of, well, what are we gonna decide for everyone that's on the front page changes. Can you talk about how your business changed once you realized the delivery channel was new? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah sure. So, uh, I mean, not for the time being thing, but like for us, uh, one of the things that's been a big challenge and a big change for us is moving to what I like to call sort of an analyst-driven technology investment culture. Um, the power of the big data platform allows us to get data in front of our analyst community much faster. It gives them the opportunity to go and do experiments and test things. And many of those things won't work, right? Some do. And those things that do are able to be thrown back over the wall to IT. In our previous life, we would build everything up front. So the business would come to us and say, hey, we need, we need these reports, we need this analytics, and we need to do it exactly this way. And so we would spend a lot of time gathering requirements, we'd spend a lot of time building something. At the end of the day, we would test it, and then we'd hand it off to the business. It probably would be half of what they wanted in the first place. Um, 
Now what we get to be in a world of is we provide you with data. We just plumb that into a big system. We give you the tools to go off and do the job yourself, which is a big challenge. It's a big change from an analyst community perspective, but they're starting to get that. And they see the power of being able to operate autonomously and do their own work, right? And then they turn back around to us and say, this is a product. We want to go build this. It works. And by the way, I've built it in this tool, and I can show you how to go operationalize it. We turn that back around into something for them in a much tighter time frame because there's much less you know, requirements gathering up front. It's much easier for us to figure out exactly what to build. And then we can turn around and give the community back something very quickly. And so that's been a huge change in the way that we think about data and how we use it. So we have 25 plus brands here in the United States, and I think we look at each of them a little bit differently. People here may not realize that Time Incorporated publishes People Magazine and Sports Illustrated and many others rather than, you know, not just Time. And so we've needed to adapt a little bit per brand based upon the need. So if you look at Time Inc. For or Time Magazine, for example, you know, we want to catch running headlines. So what we've done with a lot of our teams is we've put the engineers right in with the writers and the content creators and we've created tools that enable our content creators to quickly make changes on the website. And if they get into trouble, they've got an engineer right there. And then at the same time, the two of them together working on these agile scrum lists, right? What's the next most important thing we need and how do we get it to market quickly? And then looking at some bigger pictures, one thing I think we did that was really cool this year is we are a big presence on the red carpet, especially at the Oscars, right? And so one of the challenges we have is how do we quickly get the pictures out there? People want to know, you know, what did J-Lo wear on the red carpet, right? Ooh, of course and, it did. And, and we get, you know, we've got photographers. There are thousands of pictures being shot a minute. So we developed a tool that, that does images and could pull out of the pictures as they're feeding into us everything J-Lo, right? By looking at the face and the dress. And then we can quickly grab the ones that we think are best and the editorial team can, can get them out there, right? So if you... Um, I just said to George, I think there's an interesting technical point to make here. You're looking at one large continuous stream of information, right. and you're going to deliver it to several different constituencies based on their different set of preferences, which you expect to be able to monetize right. in different ways. And that's really an interesting analogy for the whole pivot that this conference is about, from data at rest to data in motion. Because, because those decisions have to be made while it's happening. I need Entertainment Weekly to get this shot and talk about who she was wearing. I also need, however, to feed it over to Time, which is doing a story about that particular couture house and how their finances are running right now, and use the picture to illustrate that story. That's a great metaphor for what we're doing with this technology right now. And I think if you take that to the technical realm, right, it really is about learning to build platform capabilities that can be leveraged quickly via APIs, right, so that we have one digital asset management system that has all those digital assets tagged and other groups can get to them quickly through their UI tools. Yes. Yeah, and, I think, and, and many curators. Yeah. Well, I'd say I think stream, the, you, you bring up a really good topic in stream processing because that's been a huge differentiator for us recently, right? So over the past few years, um, Alder Trader and Kelly Blue Book both have provided back to our, what we call our OEMs, or original equipment manufacturers, the Fords and the Chevys of the world, feedback on the ads that they run during the biggest sporting event of the year at the Super Bowl, and what we've done in the past is we've what we've done in the past is that we've we've taken that data overnight, we processed it, and we give feedback to the to these uh, OEMs about how they're performing in their market after they run commercials, right? And we're able to sort of see that, you know, we we can see in this hour you had some lift, you know, and it's, it, it's interesting and it def definitely gives them external validation that their spend was worthwhile, but I think. Now, as of this past year, what we were able to do is actually put Spark Streaming on top of that data flow as it's coming through. And we were, and, and we actually had an operations team in having a Super Bowl party there in the, you know, in the ops room there while this was going on. And we had That's screens, up. That, I know, right? So, but, well, I didn't get to be at home with my wife while we were watching. But anyway, so, so, so we were watching the streams go. And right, so it's, it's interesting to see, right, a commercial runs and then this huge hockey stick and it's compelling. I mean, I missed several key plays in the game because I was busy watching those, those meters as they were going along. And so that's I? not possible Ooh, without absolutely. this kind of technology. So there's an example extending what we just said where that single stream is not only being viewed multiple times by one organization, but that same stream of data is being looked at by several other organizations 
Uh, are they sharing that data? Who's providing that data? Who's brokering it and curating it and delivering it to multiple organizations, not just yours? Yep. Um, there's where we get to monetize, okay? And that's where what's the value of all this right. starts to get answered. And, and let's keep it there because in the call you said we've got to talk about security, but I'm not sure we have time. <laughs> ah. But um, I, that, and two really interesting examples, and as George whispered in my ear, Linda, you're basically redefining the concept of a magazine and building oh, a you know, yes. proprietary yeah. system to make your writers more productive. I mean, yeah. it's a huge yeah. competitive advantage. So, hypothetical. So, you've got an executive who comes to you and says, we need to do something that's completely changed the game, give us competitive advantage, drive value. Linda, you speak wallet. Ben, you speak geek. Merv, you're the bilingual translator. Okay, so, okay. so where do I start within an organization? Maybe think about some of the you know, examples without divulging you know, the big secrets, yeah. but some of the folks in the audience who might want to get started on something like this. Where do you start? Who do you bring in to that discussion? You know, what capabilities do I need? How do you decide what you can even take on? Well, so let's start with the where do you start. Mm -hmm. I spent my day to day at an offsite with executives from consumer marketing, and I think this is probably the first year they've had a technologist attend their strategy session. But this year it was important because the understanding is, is a lot of the strategies that need to be built are going to require tech. And so you want to understand right up front, are we biting off something that's so big we won't get value this year? Where, where can it fit into that stream? And so I think the starting is engaging in the conversation and really recognizing that there's a deeper partnership. I think you know, several years back there was an executive from Microsoft, I don't remember the name, that wrote a book about you know, bringing IT into the business. I think that's even more important now. The other piece is hiring not just IT professionals. You talked about this, I, and I think you would ask the question. I do have some folks who have very strong IT background, and these are, these are the core and backbone of my analytics practice. Um, but they want to become more technologists, people who invent. And so giving them that opportunity while also bringing in people who have that backbone and that experience, which is you know, partly why Colin brought me in from Microsoft and Amazon, was to bring that capability into the company. So, you know, I don't believe you do anything great without standing on the shoulders of the people who got you to where you are. So it's having that respect for the people that are there, that understand, you know, the, the, the holes and the potholes that they've hit before, and bringing in some new folks, and then getting the two to work together and watching for the magic. And Ben, from a platform Can perspective, I yeah. You do yeah, you okay, to, please. Yeah, I've, got, go I've got your translation for yeah, you. Yeah. What she just said, where do you start? Everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously, seriously. Yeah. Everybody's involved in this. Get the ideas wherever they come from. That's, that's my answer. Okay, good. Yeah. So, Great so point. So from a platform standpoint. Yeah, so from my perspective, there were, when we, when we first started down this path, there were two options we could take. We had two forks in the road. Uh, one is leverage the analyst community, work directly with them, find out from them what it is they can't do today and help them do that, right? And that's, that's key to adoption and success. And the other was a, a strictly IT play. Let me go after cost reduction and savings. Let me offload some of the expensive overnight processing we do. And, move it into a platform where it's more suited and it's, and it's certainly more cost effective. And as the late, great Yogi Berra said, when you see a fork in the road, take it. So we went both paths at the same time, right? Yeah, so, so, so in that respect, I think we're solving for two problems simultaneously. So. Excellent. Questions from the audience? Got these three practitioners, experts. Oh, great, thank you. Please, we're giving them some exercise. And yourself? Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Thank you for Hi. the panel. Fatima Bulani from UBS. Uh, this is something that Dave touched on, um, uh, the topic of security. And I'm wondering if uh, you can talk about your, your challenges and pain points with respect to you know, anything from role-based access to metadata management as it relates to Hadoop deployment That's, so, in production. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say this. When we first started down this path, our, our initial our initial thoughts around building this enterprise hub was that we would build a, a platform that was democratized and leveraged by everyone. We're going to put data in this that everyone can leverage. And, you know, I mean, no, strictly no PII included intentionally, right? And that's still our motto. But we realized very quickly that not all data is created equal and not all data can be globally accessible, right? There's data that's sometimes sensitive, like financial data, sales data. There's also data that contractually isn't available for everyone to access. Um, so we had to go tackle this. And we spent a lot of time on security, a whole lot of time on security. Um, 
you know, in the in the Hadoop world, when you sort of look at this, there's a there's a Kerberos thing that comes up a lot when we start talking about this. And while it's a technology that's been around since the 80s, I wasn't able to find anyone in the organization that had real skill in this, right? So we had to invent this. Um, wasn't going to go hire anybody either because it's about as impossible as finding a big data architect. So, so we had to challenge. We had a challenge to go fix this. We worked with our partners at Cloudera and at Red Hat to go solve for it. But it took an enormous amount of time, and it's still something that we're working through. If you, if you ask me about the things that keep me up at night. Security, resource management are two at the top of my list. And how we actually provide those entitlements is really important. Some of the tools help us with it, uh, but at the end of the day, it's got to be at the base level, right? We've got to have restrictions and we've got to have compliance. Uh, and I'm not lying to you when I say that it has been a real challenge to do that. Yeah. We, we too have spent a lot of time in security, and I would echo a lot of the same things he said. And you know, I always tell my team the most secure system is one that nobody can access. <laughs> that doesn't help us, right? But you know, looking at every vector goes back to your everything and saying what is it that we need to do to protect in this vector. And one of the things I've really pushed my team on and had a difficult time finding a good partner to help us with was I really only want somebody to be able to log into my system for that session, right? I don't want their credentials to last longer than the session that they're sitting at because I think it, at the end that's my, one of my greatest protections. If I've got my firewall down really tight and I've got you know, my PII and everything so people can't penetrate in, then I need to, to protect it at the admin level. And uh, we've been using, working with Zdata uh, and we're putting that in place. Uh, John Furrier and I asked Pat Gelsinger in theCUBE a couple years ago, is security a do-over? And he just said, yes. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Security is... Um, too often a disabler. Um, we talk about, at Gartner, we talk about bimodal IT a lot, where, where there's a place where you get agile and you throw the rules out and you, you invent and you create and you, and you imagine. Um, security can enable that if it's applied correctly. If there is some data that I need to make sure is not exposed, I redact it, I mask it, I give people a sandbox where they can play with all the rest of it. Now, I may squeeze a few pieces out in that process that might turn out to have been valuable, but I'm probably going to be busy for a while. If I can provide a sandbox with some guardrails, I can probably still get a lot of work done inside it. Security in that environment is actually an enabler because it gives me a place where it is safe to experiment, and to your point, safe to fail, you know, if it needs to be, because failure won't mean exposure. Failure would just mean the project didn't work. And that's a very different value proposition. So can I translate for you? Guys? Oh, please. <laughs> there you go. So I think part of and what I, I heard from you that, that I really, that I really uh, believe in and we are doing is try to use your technology as much as you can as a protector, right? And masking data is a big one. Because then you aren't inhibiting your data lake and in, in access in, in the deeper ways. So. Yep. Other questions? We've got to wrap shortly, but I want to make sure that you guys have a chance to chime in. All right, good. We've kept you for a while here. Uh, Oh, last question. Better be a good one. Gokul. Hi, I'm Gokul Amistra from Oracle. Um, I hear a lot of uh, speakers talking about um, collect all forms of data and everything your company creates and just keep collecting and you know, put it in this data lake. Who knows, maybe you know, you'll find some uh, value out of it someday, right? Who's going to fund this? Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to fund right. it? The storage guys love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about that? They certainly do. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't, you can't be a complete pack rat with this data, right? I mean, it costs something, and that's, that's certainly a challenge. I mean, I think the only way that happens is that, you know, you have engaged business partners that understand the value of the data and drive that. Otherwise, you can't just keep data for the sake of keeping it, right? So. I think for, for us, you know, Joe Ripp really understands the value of data. And we're able to make a real, we were last year able to make a really good business case on the backward looking. But on the forward looking, he took a leap of faith with us. And, you know, we're building tools now to, to demonstrate and show what can be done. And I think there is a piece of that predictive that you don't know what you don't know until you get into the data. And, but I don't think you're going to be funded for a lot of years if you can't show that value. Yeah, and Gokul's question is kind of the yin and the yang of value and liability. You know, so Einstein would say, keep it as long as you can, but no longer. You know, but then there's the value equation. All right, we're out of time. But Linda and Ben, thank you so much as practitioners for sharing your insights. You know how busy you guys are.
And Merv, I have to say, on behalf of the whole Cube and SiliconANGLE uh -huh. Wikibon community, we just love the collaboration with you. We appreciate your time, and thank, uh, you. thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks, All right. Thanks, All right. Uh, John Furrier is here, and uh, I want to turn the mic over to John. All right, how about a round of applause for that great customer panel, great content. <laughs> Merv, customers, great job. Okay, so we have raffle gifts. So put this over here. So we have three giveaways. We have, um, I actually think this is the best gift because I love GoPro. GoPro Hero with a selfie stick, kind of a GoPro stick. I won't call it a selfie stick because it's one of the, I'm anti-selfie stick, but I think that's ridiculous. But